Hello, welcome to this uh, interview. Um, we hope it's all going to work well. You know, having two people remotely connected means the bus factor is doubled or halved. I'm not sure how to say that. We are taking more risks. We have uh, Roy from uh, calling in from California. I'm in Switzerland myself. The servers are somewhere. We have no idea where. So we hope it's all going to hold. Um, so this is uh, an interview with Roy Fielding on HTTP. I'm looking forward to that a lot. I hope you are also. Uh, I've been doing HTTP pretty much since it exists, I would say, or maybe a few years later. And Roy's been doing that as well, but on a totally different level. So um, we're looking forward to that. Uh, we will be taking all audience questions. We have uh, Radu Cotescu in the background watching the, the chat. So the um, the stage chat, make sure, you know, there's the event chat, with, which is for general discussion about the conference. And the stage chat is especially for this talk. So that's where you can ask your questions. And Radu will select uh, the ones, depending on how time goes, uh, select a few ones that we can take. So I'm not sure if Roy Fielding uh, needs an introduction, but <laughs> I'm still trying to do one. So Roy works as a senior principal scientist at Adobe. And um, besides having invented REST, the REST architectural style, as part of his PhD, he's been working on the HTTP protocol and specifications almost since the beginning of that. Uh, he is also co-founder and current chairman of the Apache Software Foundation. We are also working together there. I'm also currently on the, the board of directors, so we, we also interact there, but that's a, a different uh, context, I would say. So, hi, Roy. Welcome hey. to this uh, interview. Hello, Bertrand. Good morning. I guess it's uh, pretty yes. early. Good morning here. Yeah. So, here, the just getting dark, so <laughs> we're doing really the global interview. Um, so the, the first question, um, what's the story behind you getting involved in HTTP? How did that happen? I think, I think, you know, Tim Berners-Lee personally, so you were involved in the very beginning of that, but how, how did that happen? Well, what happened was I, I was a, um, a graduate student at UC Irvine, uh, when the web started and, and when I got involved, really the, the web started as a proposal in 1989 and really a project in, in 1991. And um, I did not get involved until 1993. But the first version of the web was very simple, as if HTTP itself was just one line get and then a, a, a URL. And um, the, uh, the way I got involved, I, I was working on, as a graduate student. I finished my classes and basically just messing around with the internet. I was, uh, I had uh, great access to be at, working at UCI as a direct connection to the internet and a sun workstation on my desk um, and a lot of free time to, to play with the internet. So I, I spent a lot of time on net news and uh, picked up the web when it uh, first came out via NCSA in their um, alpha browser for NCSA Mosaic. So that was the beginning mm -hmm. of 1993. Yeah, what, what was the what was the geographical area that the web covered? Was it already global at the time, or was it just California, Silicon Valley, or what was that? It was already global. I mean, the the first place was in was in Geneva at CERN, um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, very close to you. And yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the uh, I think the second site was in Stanford at Slack. Um, so it, it started out in the high energy physics research community where they're, they're very high end labs. There aren't very many labs, but there are, there are a few mm. around the yeah, world yeah. and other physics researchers had spread throughout the universities. They basically, they'd go to CERN, they'd find out about the web, um, and they take it home with them when they left their tour at CERN. Mm. Um, and so there was, there was, um, individuals active around the web, but not very many sites. Uh, I think when I started, there was uh, 48 sites. In fact, I'm sure there's 48 sites because um, one of the first things I did was was try to find out, you know, what this thing was about. And I I went through the page of all of the uh, published websites out there, and there, yeah. there were about 48. And I, you know, started one end of the page, looked at them all, looked at all their links, went down the bottom, and finished it in one day. 
And right. know, it was totally cool. You know, I watched the entire web in one day. And I got yeah, towards the yeah. end, right at the bottom of the page, and all of a sudden there were two more sites as they announced <laughs> that the fiftieth site had been had been published while I was reading it. And so I'm like, right. oh cool. Uh, this is obviously growing. Um, but it was a it was a new, very new project there, and it was all computer scientists and, and physicists who were working on it. There was nothing commercial about it at all. Right. And the physicists were interested in terms of sharing uh, research data, research information? Was that, is that yeah, their uh, angle? Basically, basically the notes and the experiments, more than anything else, just their personal notes of, of what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the first websites were things like the, the phone book. You know, that just, right. They were information that was already stored on, on systems inside CERN that nobody could access from the outside. And so they provided gateways into those systems as the easiest uh, first problem. It's the same with Slack. Slack provided access to their library system at um, at Stanford. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you mentioned Geneva. So my my first uh, experience with the web, I will never forget that. Actually, I was I was dialing into a Sun workstation in Geneva. I was paying, for, you know, for that access. I was dialing in by modem to that, and I remember very much at that time I was already doing some some stuff with the. Uh, uh, Usenet news and FTP to retrieve files around. There was R key to, to search for files. And, and then I was on this workstation. I, I used the links text browser and I, I didn't click. I, I pressed enter on the link and, and then suddenly I was on the server on the other, on the other side of the ocean. And that was, yeah. uh, that was the magic of the web today. It's totally, yeah, we don't, we don't think about that anymore, yeah. except when it's slow. Yeah, it's it's funny to think about one of the probably one of the most awesome browsers was Lynx and uh yeah. stuff done by Lou Montoli. And that was at that yeah, was University still, of Kansas. Yeah. Yeah. It's still it's still very I used Lynx the other day because I wanted to extract the text of a of a HTML page and Lynx Lynx minus minus dump, I think, gets you the, the you mm -hmm. know the HTML without all the, the stuff that we put around yeah. it nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Um you you mentioned the simplicity of HTTP, and uh, for me that was fascinating. I, I used to teach uh, before before I joined Day Software and then Adobe, and I was I was uh, I was teaching uh, Unix administration kind of classes, and I was teaching my students to implement the dead simple web server because that you know the protocol was open a socket, uh, receive if you do the server receive one line with a get and the uh, and the path and send that. Was that simplicity by design? Was that you know a conscious decision to make it dead simple? I would say, or was that was that because there was no time to make it more complicated? Yes, I mean certainly the first the first conversation I had with Tim Berners Lee about the design of the web was simplicity was the first thing he mentioned. Um, hmm. More than anything else, for uh, low entry barrier for for people editing for the web for getting for for starting with the web. But also, you know, just just trying to simplify what what he sort of an early exposure to the internet protocols was was fairly complicated. Um, the socket interface by that time was was pretty well established for TCP, mm. um, and uh, he had been using FTP for the, as the first initial transfer protocol. But what he found was mm. FTP. You first log in, and then you list the sites. And then, yep. or list the files on this page, and then you go down a set of directories to get the, to the directory you want, and you list right. those files, and then you retrieve them. And it's just too many steps. Um, mm. And so, what he was interested in doing was was reducing the perceived latency for people who are clicking on a hypertext link. They already know right. exactly where they're going because that's what the hypertext link tells you. It tells you all those steps. Um, the, the URL tells you all the steps. So uh, what he wanted was the simplest possible um, direct low latency response. And for at the time, this is back in 91, um, there was there were no other data formats to worry about. There was just HTML. Oh. So he, he would do get, he'd send the document ID, which was the early form of, of the uh, URL, and then um, get back an HTML page. And if the HTML page started with um, plain text as a tag, then the rest of it was plain text. Um, so that right. that was 
the whole of the protocol is described in one page. Mm. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think the it's I think we can be very thankful for that design because otherwise we might have ended up with you know having to type FTP commands forever. Sometimes you <laughs> sometimes people see something they say it works, you know, why why do you need to change it? So it's great that we have we say, no, nah, nah, that's way too complicated. Let's make that much simpler. Yeah, it, it yeah. really that it really comes out of the URL design that, that really hasn't changed right. much in all this time. Um mm. and I also worked on the URL specs as well, but uh, for that, it's more of a trying to explain the philosophy than than changes. HTTP has gone right. through a lot of changes to um, to support, you know, first of all, images, and then to mm. uh, to support all the different things that we wanted to add to the web. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of speaking of changes, what are the so? Okay, I'm a I'm a I'm a web developer. I also do some work in the in the server space via Apache Sling, where we do you know, which is a resource uh, request processing framework. We could say. Uh, so, what are the next few important changes that uh, an, a web developer like me should be should be keeping track of in the in the evolution of HTTP? I understand some changes are really meant for backbones or data centers, and but as a developer, what what should I care about? Yeah, I mean, right now there's there's a, a huge culture change in the way the standards are developed. In the sense that, you know, when we started uh, with with HTTP 1.0, there's a lot of different implementations of HTTP, different browsers and different servers. Um, a lot of different companies were interested, uh, mostly from the user side. So you had people like Digital and IBM and Sun um, were interested in developments of the protocol because it was all new, and universities as well. Um, and, and really, the, it was the open source folks who ruled the roost on that because we could share our tools and quickly collaborate across the internet. And protocol development is is another form of open development. It and right. it's not open source in the in the sense of code, but it's open source in the sense of we write these RFC documents, um, we collaborate on their development, and we do that over email. Uh, almost oh. all entirely via email, and uh, in fact, these days we do our our the editorial collaboration for the current version of HTTP specs is all done via GitHub, just like any software project. Um, so we we do these things, but the the culture has changed quite a bit because the people who are mostly implemented HTTP, mostly impacted by changes to HTTP are the, the large CDNs, the content distribution networks like Fastly and Akamai and Cloudflare. Um, and then the others are the huge mega sites. So um, Google and Facebook and Apple are very interested in, in improvements to the protocol because it can make it, it can make a huge difference to you know how they deploy their systems and how efficient their their entire revenue stream is. And unlike before, you know, it used to be open source. We would rule the roost, and and now it's just open source is everywhere. Um, so all these right. developers, all all the standards developers, are used to working in the open. They're they're used to you know collaborating via email. And and right now, what's happening is uh, the quick. Which I'll get to in a minute. Um, Quick is is a replacement for TCP, basically over UDP, and it's just been approved by the IETF, um, and it will it'll be published in a couple months in the final version. But the the drafts are done, um, and the uh, HTTP three is in IETF last call. So that's the the last stage of where the the Internet Engineering Steering Group decides if the specification is complete enough to publish as a proposed standard. Right. So Quick is a replacement for, for TCP that runs over UDP. Could it be used for different, you know, is, are there any plans to use it for other things like file sharing or, or other, other protocols? Or is that currently just you know really focused on HTTP uh, semantics? There are a lot of people who plan to use it for various things, um, but they haven't been allowed to. Essentially, in order to get quick done, in order to get the the specifications out, they wanted to choose one protocol to deliver, and it was really right. the, the reason Google developed Quick in the first place was to deliver HTTP. 
Um, so this is a, a protocol that that uh, the Google server teams um, developed called Google Quick. They deployed it a long time ago, I think three years ago, and um, and it, it, it's very effective if you have control over you know both clients and servers, particularly mm. in the case of Google, they have Chrome and yeah. the um, their own services. But primarily services like YouTube, where there's a lot of uh, large amounts of data being streamed and um, problems with head of line blocking if you do it all over uh, TLS. So if you do encrypted data transfer, um, one of the problems that occurs is that if you lose one of those packets, you have to start the whole stream over. It, it doesn't work very well as a, um, in, a, in a lossy environment. And uh, one of the primary goals for HTTP3 or, or HTTP over quick is to enable to do multiple streams, a lot like HTTP2 uh, multiplexing, but doing it over UDP um, with uh, essentially multiplex TLS streams below it. So that if you lose one, um, one encrypted package of bytes, uh, it only affects that one stream as opposed to all the streams mm. on the same same connection. Um, so I, I guess I should describe sort of the overview of of, of how these protocols work out. Um, so we had HTTP 0.9 to begin with. That was in 1993 to 19, or 1990 to 93. Mm. And, and this was, was the one I was mentioning where you know you send just one line uh, and you get your your HTML back, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that was the, the simplest possible two-page spec. And it did very little for you except for provide a connection via TCP. Mm -hmm. And um, so then we wanted to introduce inline images to HTML. And in order to do that, we also wanted you need to send more than just HTML pages over the web. So then the web became a multiple content types um, access. And the way to do that within the internet was using MIME types for email. Um, the easiest way to, um, I, should I say, the easiest way to get consensus on a decision within the ITF is do the same thing everyone else did and just tweak it mm. slightly. Um, right. It, it's not exactly good design in the sense that it, it's not ideal for the application you're working on, but it's pretty good. What we're doing is essentially uh, reusing all of the engineering knowledge that's been gained from those past systems and learning from it and extending it just a little so that we spend 99% of our arguing over little tiny things instead of massive design changes. Because it's very difficult to obtain consensus if, if you're not almost in agreement. Um, so HTTP 1.0 added the MIME format uh, with and header fields, so you can send metadata. Uh, and it was developed by the entire web. People, uh, we frequently think of Tim Berners-Lee as the father of the web, um, but really he didn't develop 1.0. It was the entire www-talk mailing list with 60 people talking uh -huh. continuously over the course of, of a year. Um, and each of the groups plugging that into their software and trying out very various things. And uh, when I became the HTTP editor in 1994, um, 1.0 was just all over the place. There, there were extensions to do just about everything you could imagine via the web. And we actually cut HTTP in half, basically all the, all the deployed experiments. We picked out the ones that we knew would work between multiple servers that were developed independently. And that was that's what was published as HTTP 1.0. And then at the same time, Henrik and I, Henrik Nielsen was working with me on the HTTP specs, and we started designing HTTP 1.1. And 1.1 was a clean implementation of most of what people had experimented with, um, but done in a way that where we could add um, safe caching and entity tags, persistent connections, um, the host header field, so you could so you could have multiple hosts per IP address, um, chunked encodings, things like that. Being able to frame messages so that you could transfer them um, effectively across the internet without 
at least uh, at least knowing when you lose data on, on the receiving end. And that's what ended up in RFC 2068, which I think was 96 or 97. And then it was republished in 2619. And then seven, you know, 10 years ago, we got together again and, and um, updated everything for RFC 7230 through 35. Basically, we split the entire protocol out into uh, five specs, got each of those concepts documented pretty well. It's, people have been pretty happy with it and then publish those. And right now we're finishing a, what turned out to be a three-year project um, to separate all of HTTP semantics from HTTP 1.1 messaging. So now we have a HTTP core semantics document that all of the versions of HTTP can refer to. And um, that's in working group last call right now. You said there were about sixty people working uh, on the on the spec in the HTTP. I think one one time. Is it has that number stayed pretty much constant, or is that varying? No, it varies all the time. No, there, there were about sixty people working in, in, on the the web project itself on the public mm. uh, mailing list. So this was for one dot When one dot came out as oh, now we're going to send MIME and to to tell. To tell you that it's mine, we'll stick HTTP 1.0 at the end, whereas before it had nothing uh, at the end right. of the first line. And then it was just a matter of experimentation through that, the whole process of developing 1.0 amongst everyone. I mean, I added uh, conditional requests, so the if modified since header field and um, also the date field value. It, it looks like an internet message format date, whereas it used to have a two digit year. You know, things like that. Those are that I added to HTTP about eight months before I became the HTTP editor. Right. Yeah. So the, going back to the things you were mentioning about quick and, the, you know, uh, it being more efficient in when you were using um, uh, TLS and stuff. Uh, so as a web developer, I would pretty much get that magically i mean you know uh once my server layer is updated should i should i change the way i'm implementing my my web servers or dynamic web serving or maybe it enables new things that we could not do in the past well mostly the intention is that you won't won't even notice uh, the, mm. the intention is that all the features that you rely on now won't change at all. Um, yeah. But uh, there are performance changes in, in the sense that um, with HTTP 2 and much more so with HTTP 3, you can do all of your requests on one multiplex connection mm. instead of on um, multiple connections. Yeah. So any 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 time you want to do things like what what people would constantly ask for batch methods, where you could send a special batch me method where you could send fifty posts up one stream before getting the answer, things like that. You don't need that anymore at all because right. you can send independent multiplex streams across HTTP two or HTTP three, and it it has the same effect. Um, the uh, there's still differences in the way things are inputted and an awareness of backwards compatibility. So the most people who are are implementing HTTP three right now are the big sites and the big CDNs. So if you're using Cloudflare or uh, Fastly or Akamai, then you're going to get it automatically. Um, mm. You just have to. In some cases, you can disable it if it's not working out for you. Um, but usually you can um, get the latest version of HTTP, whatever is currently possible with the client uh, would come automatically. Uh, and it's particularly true with uh, like Google services and um, Chrome uh, for a long time has been implemented Google Quick because they could look at the client and look at the server. And since they, they knew both supported the protocol, wh whichever version of the protocol it was, they could quickly dynamically choose the highest, best version of the protocol to use. Um, so that's most of what YouTube has been using for a long time now.
Mm, right. So maybe maybe some some workarounds that we did, you know, to cope with the the la the problems of multiple connections. We can just forget about that, but no other changes basically at the application level, right? In theory. Yes. <laughs> you do. <laughs> yeah, of in course. <laughs> if, if it all works yeah. out and people don't don't implement bug or there's no bugs, there's no intermediaries in between, right. you, you know, you're not using a proxy. There's there's yeah. a lot of caveats in the sense that um, things can can go wrong, or you may be stuck with mm. a a person using a modem from some right strange location. Yes. And there's nothing we can do about that. Um, but yes, if you're yes, if you're right. on a high end connection and and you you are directly connected to Google Fiber and all that stuff, then yeah, it's 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 very nice. Um, the nice thing about it, uh, from my perspective, what's what's really nice is that. Uh, even with all of these additions to the protocols, they're still carrying the same semantics. So anything you can say via HTTP3, any, any application you could build via HTTP3 can be sent via HTTP1 if you need to. So you can still right. support those older systems. And yeah. um, the, just the, the clients and the servers will adjust their behavior accordingly, hopefully. Um, yeah. Of course, you know, any, with any new protocol, there's always a chance that we messed up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe you should add that to the to the spec. You know, say you should not implement any bugs. That's <laughs> make our life easier. I have one for you. you should not lie, or you must not lie. <laughs> yes, yes, right. Uh, we're starting to get some audience questions. So um, I have a we have a question from John. Where is that? I have to. Say, yeah. What What do you think our next wow moment will be with the web? What's you know, it's always hard to predict the future, but where do you see, like, you know, like when I first clicked the uh, hyperlink, that for me, that was a change, a big change. And what what's next in your opinion? Or what would you like to be next? Honestly, I have always thought of wow moments as, oh my God, we've done something wrong. Um, <laughs> no, the, uh, uh, the the biggest wow moments for me have always been, always been associated with content. So it's, uh, I when I first started, what what really made me want to work on the web, as opposed to all the other research I was doing, was uh, some sites in Chicago about the Maori people of New Zealand, um, because I'm part Maori and uh, really the only access to that information I'd have is via the internet, because there's nothing in the libraries around here. Um, and so what what my big wow moment was, well, I can go to a site in Chicago and find out information about people in New Zealand. Um, and everyone can share that information all over the world instantly. In fact, you know, what, what I used to say is that at any given time, um, there is one person in, in the world who knows more about the subject than anyone else. And then you're oh. guaranteed to find them on the web. I mean, that's, that's just where they are. Uh, and and a situation like that, uh, where you can you can put together all of humanity and access them, is is extremely powerful. Now it's both powerful for good and it can be powerful for bad. But what I find is that most people who are collaborating together are are excellent people. Yeah, I agree. That's right. And uh, yeah. I think you're right to say that what makes a difference is the content and enabling people to create content and to share it, share it freely. It's interesting what's happening here. I would say with sometimes the older people, they they have time to spend on the web and they 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 will do surprising things. You know, you say no, they're the old folks, but they, it can be yeah, it can be life changing, it's especially as you get older and you may be less able to move around. That's a big difference. But it's also freedom. I mean, you know. One of the reasons I went to grad school was to have the freedom to choose what I wanted to do. And a lot of people, especially mm. people who have retired, um, they've been working in all their lives and, and suddenly what are they going to do? It's like, well, there's one of the things they can do from the home is use the internet and create content of, yeah. of one variety or another. And that's right. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a very empowering feeling that you can do that. Yeah, I think I think we've seen that with the you know with the COVID situation where there was there were less activities, less travel, 
I've been I've been doing some more music myself, and and yeah, if if you do it just for yourself, it's a bit boring. If you could share it on the web, maybe you get two likes, and that's <laughs> that's a yeah. good thing. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm slowly improving my webcam setup. So, uh, cool, great. Uh, so Achim is asking how how your typical workday looks like. So how much coding, how much spec work, how much time you spend negotiating with people in this spec work? How does that how does that look? Oh, uh, right now it's a mess. Um, <laughs> I've got a, a ten year old son, and um, so my my daily schedule tends to revolve around uh, interrupts, um, but. Uh, you know, mostly I spend most of my time doing email. I get about uh, 1,000 emails a day. Uh, half of those are spam. So they're ha half of them are, are fairly easy to filter out, but the other half are a mixture of, of developers working at Adobe, um, developers working at the Apache Software Foundation, um, people who are trying to find a solution and think that maybe maybe I have the answer for them. <laughs> um, and the rest of my time is spent on Twitter. Oh, no, not seriously. Um, <laughs> actually, a lot, of, a lot of time is spent just trying to figure out what on earth is going on with the world, especially this year. Yeah. All right. And and another question from Casimir: uh, How did you how did you end up at Day Software? How how did it start? I don't think I I know even. Oh, day. Um, well, I, I was at UCI and I finished my dissertation in 2000 on REST. Um, and in just before I finished in 1999, I, um, I got together the group of locals, uh, local uh, software developers in, in Orange County. And we, we put together a company called eBuilt. Ebuilt did develop sites, basically developed new sites and services for other companies uh, and for venture capital. Um, and so we quickly grew from zero people into, I think, 350 people in one year. Uh, in Orange County, that would be a, a fairly large company, particularly in software. And uh, at the same time, I was chairman of the Apache Software Foundation. Um, so I became their chief scientist uh, because I was interested in the group and just because it was an, as a great group of people and they had a lot of fun and everything was just going great until the stock stock market collapsed. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, uh, suddenly all of the venture capital money got pulled out of the startup's hands and all the contract developers, which were us, uh, you know, didn't have money to pay our developers. So we yeah. went from that 300 developers down to 120 in the matter of months after that, which was depressing as hell. And, um, and what happens, one of those, uh, I had, during that process, I had met uh, David Neuschler from Day, the CTO of Day. And uh, he, he asked me to help out with the uh, Java server process and explain how he could start up what, what eventually became JSR 170 or the, the JCR API. So I helped him get started. I taught him taught him about the JSP and and taught him how how the the uh, Java server process works re in reality, as opposed to you know what was on their um, PR stuff. And uh, and so that enabled Day to create the 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 JCR interface. And in the process, you know, I got to know the company. I got to know the developers. One of the guys from that I helped found eBuilt with had had gone to work for for day, and so I knew it was a good group of people, and so I, I shifted over to day. We we had a, a headquarters building, U.S. headquarters in Newport Beach, and the the real headquarters in um, in Switzerland. Um, and roughly thirty days after I was hired. Um, the board of directors found out that the CFO and others were uh, spending all of the money on advertising and, and they <laughs> shut down the American um, subsidiary. So it was one of those things where it's uniquely 2001 experience um, yeah. of, you know, post um, post stock market collapse and, and all that stuff. Um, but I, I did like working with David and the the uh, overall architecture exactly fit what I thought was needed for content management 
um, because that was the biggest, by far the the biggest um, request of companies was to build content management mm. systems at the time. Yep. So I thought I thought the software was good. The team was incredibly awesome, and uh, and that's how I ended up staying. You know, the Newport Beach office turned into an eight person office instead of a hundred person, and we just kept plugging at it. So was that all eight uh, eight technical people or? Uh, no, was I was. Mix? I uh, was that only? I think maybe two or three technical people, and. Um, you know, through the lean times of of the 90s or 90s, 2000s. Um, and, uh, but the team in Basel, you know, Switzerland is, has this great uh, idea of, you know, when times are bad in the industry, you can work or the company will pay you full time, but you work half time. And it's essentially like extending unemployment, except you're not unemployed, you're actually working um huh. just half the time and through that mechanism all of the pretty much the entire original day software team was able to make it through the downturn in the stock market yeah and uh, at the end of it you know we were well positioned to become uh the the best content management system and you know for a long time um uh, day cq was by far and away the best technologically but we didn't have the name um to oh. go with it we didn't have a, a well-established marketed brand and so when adobe purchased day 10 years ago um it immediately uh made us a uh, a worldwide um a content management product system. or brand yeah right yeah. you know we had we had sales worldwide already but we weren't in the first three of every conversation Yes, you know, people, people, yeah. people would have to learn about us before they'd be willing to trust us with their software. Whereas now uh, we're the first pick generally, and uh, right, you know, yeah, seen seen from the other side. So I was I was with Day Software just three days, three years before the acquisition, and then really yeah, when we inherited the Adobe Salesforce, you know, the, the, the salespeople and everything that made a huge difference. Because I, I agree, the product was technically very good. Uh, and in Europe, sometimes we're a bit shy on sales. I think, you know, we're, yeah. I know we engineers, we, tend, we're happy with the thing. And, and sometimes we, we, we're a bit shy about selling it. So that was, that was a great move. Yeah. But it's a good balance, though, because in the States, we're, we're not shy enough. So yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But having having the both of having the the worldwide um scope the way we did was was very beneficial to to how we approached everything particularly the in developers because um because we were doing open source projects the whole time to do yeah. open development the entire time and to attract open developers like yourself to into the company while we were still small was was significant had a huge impact. Yeah. Plus, yeah. uh, we have good sorry, people. yeah, good people yeah. to work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah I totally agree. Um, Gunnar is asking about simplicity. So you said simplicity was a benefit to adoption. Uh, is that still a design goal today? And is it still possible to remain reasonably simple in the in the new world of HTTP three? It is. Um, but it's it's more this has more to do with the the simplicity is in the interfaces so if uh -huh. you think of of the overall simplicity of the http as an api so http as a set of methods um here are the header fields uh all the resources have the same interface they don't have a different interface for each resource things like that all of that design is still there so we we still focus on the simplicity of the interface as opposed to creating a different interface for every application uh -huh. Right. Um, yeah, so. it's certainly. But in, in terms of implementation, HTTP two is much dif more difficult than HTTP one. I mean, it, it's a huge difference in in the implementation cost of getting it right. Uh, it's the same with HTTP three. Uh, HTTP three, you're you're dealing with basically implementing the entire stack of of HTTP and TCP and TLS within one implementation, um, and it gives you a lot of flexibility, less dependence on other other people's software. Um, but it is a yeah. much more difficult for the infrastructure to implement. 
Um, right. But, you know, it, you know, as it goes, you know, fewer people are implementing the app, the infrastructure anyways. Um, now most people are getting their HTTP services via those large CDNs. Um, yep. So, and the, the smaller sites can keep using HTTP one if they want. There's not a huge benefit in terms of technological advancement. Um, there's not a huge benefit over HTTP one unless you're doing um, authentication and fairly mm. complex requests, multiple requests per site. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah. So the simpler cases might might use simpler versions of the protocol. And then if you're really doing high high traffic stuff, you need the the latest thing, right? Right. Yeah. Um, okay, there's two minutes left. Uh, we have one question from Yuval. Um, do you think that the technology is, and standards can help protect the freedom of sharing of almost, I would say almost freedom of speech in countries which are not generally uh, willing to do that? Can the can the open standards help uh, you know fight the the closedness as, uh, that some countries would want? Um, yes and no. I mean, yes, in the sense that the fact that we've made these technologies ubiquitous and easily accessible to anyone who can download software um, that has made it extremely difficult for for individual areas to get cut off from the internet. But um, countries that are focused on doing that have are well aware of how to cut off the internet. So there are countries who can flip a switch and all internet access sure. into the country is, is removed. And there's, there's simply nothing we can do from a standards perspective um, to get around that. Um, the only real way that will change is um, satellites that can't be interfered with um being used as a replacement for the uh for the higher speed cables um, because they're it's just more difficult to interfere um, but percent, again yeah. it's it, it, that's it's like a most large social problems can't really be solved via technology um sometimes they can bring people together who would want to solve them together uh, mm. but really yeah. um it's it's fairly rare that they um change things it's still it's still human beings on both sides of the connection yeah that's right yeah okay so it looks like hopping is going to hopping is working like a swiss clock it's going to cut off cut us off in 18 seconds so <laughs> any <laughs> good last words that you can say in 12 seconds <laughs> no thank you Bertrand. and uh like you said we're, we're still working in the apache and at at the uh, Adobe and having a great time. So um, good luck with the rest of the conference, uh, with the, the rest of meet in and um, wish I could be there in person. But of course, we're all stuck in our little places. Have yeah, fun. that's right. But it's been great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roy. And the conference is just beginning. So people should, if they're still hearing us, I'm not sure <laughs> they should still uh, stay around. Thank you. And bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>